Many of you have watched my cosmic climate catastrophe video. Many of you follow Ben Davidson over at Suspicious Observer. Many of you have seen the entire video registry over at Doug Vogt's channel. So when I say terms like micronova, solar outburst, pole shift, Adam and Eve story, you know what I'm talking about. But let's get to the science and let's learn something together. We can unravel a lot about our entire past by looking at the data set in front of us. The Epica Antarctic 1.6, the Vostok Antarctica 1.6, the GISP 2 Greenland 0.9, and the ocean sediment data, all overlain. And they all correlate, corroborate each other on global temperature departure. The pink line is the modern normal, which is the baseline for what we've been living in recent times. If you want to know about climate catastrophe, you can see a 100,000 year cycle here repeating. And, it, and it's repeating in a pattern, like a heartbeat, with smaller cycles. And we've just gotten another major pulse, like back here. Boom, 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 like a drum beat. And uh, since 1989, I thought that the Milankovitch theory explained this. But it's too erratic. It looks electric. It's hypnotic. But it is a repeated cycle that is proven from all data sets worldwide that correlates to something big, something otherworldly, outside of Earth. It's a cosmic signal, a cosmic catastrophic signal that we're just getting our grip on. Now, we know a lot about the heliospheric current sheet. It's the surface within the solar system where the polarity of the sun's magnetic field changes from north to south. And, and we can image it three-dimensionally. So you can see the scale of the sun and the planets, not the scale, but you can see the three-dimensional dynamics and this is what the 11-year solar cycle is all about. Interplanetary plasma in a sheet. 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the universe is this plasma. And we, we have a very good grip on galactic cosmic ray modulation and the passage of the heliospheric current sheet at Earth. It's an 11-year half cycle, 22 years for a full sheet, a full sine wave, a full polar solar reversal it takes 22 years of that sheet. So now if we learn a little bit about plasma scaling and 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the universe is plasma moving around as electric current sheets in a sinusoidal wave, that means that these types of sheets occur at every scale, not just the solar system scale where you have a sun and some planets which experience the sheet repeatedly again and again and again every 22 years. They go through a ripple, full ripple every 22 years hits each planet. But on the galactic scale, what type of sheets exist in the the galaxy we're in, and, and do we even know about them? Well, there is a repetitive pattern that has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the cosmos. These cosmogenic signals, we're scaling it up. So clearly we can see in the Milky Way the spiral arms. Now these arms have long been known and postulated to be the causation of a mass extinction cycle. 
the cosmic clock, the cycle of terrestrial mass extinction. It's not a new idea. It's been an ongoing hypothesis that has been regurgitated from scientist to scientist because it's provable that we live in a cosmically forced cyclic environment unlike anything you've been taught. Mass extinctions at 415, 330, 322 million years ago, 300, 145, and 33 million years ago. The simulations indicate the sun has spent approximately 60% of its time passing through our galaxy's various spiral arms. And mass extinction and the structure of the Milky Way has become very clear. So why wouldn't we expect other layers of cyclicity to be in the sheet? Not just these arms, but smaller ripples. Ones that correlate to magnetic reversals. We know at a small scale from beryllium and carbon-14 that cosmic rays and the sun's output are directly connected. And it's directly connected to climate. Here you're looking at the Oort minimum, the wolf, the spore, the maunder, the dalton, the centennial. And the graph is showing you the cosmogenics of it all. Because carbon-14 production increases when it gets colder. Period. It's a car, it is a cosmogenic force, forcing mechanism. <clears throat> so why isn't the magnetic excursion also cosmogenic? It is. But we're just learning the mechanism. We're just lear learning now, together, that every 12,000 years or so, because it fluctuates, we're in a ripple and we go through periods of extreme weather, extreme geologic events, including volcanism, earthquakes, mountain building. And we go through evolutionary processes again and again and again, like a clock. And the reason we're affected here on Earth is because our helio sheath and our heliosphere are compromised. Now, based on all that information, if there's a ripple coming, Ben Davidson put out a great video, you would expect that these effects to be hitting nearby stars. So you go to look for the closest stars to Earth. And then you start to work out the geometry of the universe relative to the sheet. And what you find is the two closest stars are Proxima Centauri and then Barnard's star. So if, you, if I've lost you, let's get you back. If this sheet is coming and we're, let's say, stationary, and it's when we hit the green line that things go boom, then the second furthest star, Barnard's star, should have already gone boom, which it has. Oh, we've, I don't know what happened there. I apologize. Let's bring it back. So here's a list of the nearby stars and brown dwarfs. And you can see that Proxima Centauri is the closest at 4.2 light years. And then here's Barnard's star at about 6 light years. Stick with me. We're going to start with Barnard's star. The star is about six light years away, and it doesn't matter what constellation it is in. The only thing that matters now is that the current sheet hit it recently, if this hypothesis is correct. In 1998, there was a major flare on Barnard's star, a star which astronomers thought was dead and incapable of flaring. So, hypothetically, in 1998, the star flared when it shouldn't have because the current sheet hit it. 
Now this is six light years away, so it actually flared in 1992. Stick with me. Proxima Centauri. It just released a flare so powerful it was visible to the unaided eye. And this star is only 4.2 light years away. And it flared in 2016, which means it actually flared in 2012. Because it takes four years if something is four light years away to get to us. <coughs> it's just simple math. So I created this simple graphic. If Barnard Star is six light years away and it flared in 1998, which means it actually flared in 1992 because it's six light years away. And Proxima Centauri then flared in 2016, which is four light years away, which really means it flared in 2012. You can then do the math of the wave approaching us. And, it, and the shock wave is moving at two light years in 20 years. Or about one light year per decade. Which means it's less than four light years away from us. And we have less than four decades. Our star is on deck to flare exactly when Doug Vogt predicted. Because a light year is the distance that light travels in a vacuum in one year. Six trillion miles or ten trillion kilometers. One might therefore conclude that in order to travel one light year at one-tenth the speed of light, this trip takes ten years. So just less than four decades from now, we should be hit with the wave. It won't all come at once. There's going to be an uptick prior to that where we're going to see massive activity in the other planets in our solar system, maybe in the supposed Oort cloud or far off objects. It'll be very interesting. It's anyone's guess what our future is or if this timing is correct. But the data is very clear and becoming clearer at every scaling level. Are you ready for the sheet to hit? Are you preparing? Be safe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'd be happy to answer them. We're working this through together.